Welcome to Future Role Model, a podcast that praises the unconventional and redefines what it means to be a role model. I am your host, Natasha Pearl Hansen. <laughs> You're laughing at that intro. Wow. I have my guest, Eddie <laughs> Della Sepe. I finally pronounced it correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was like a, that was, you, you said that very well. Thank you. I've been saying it for quite some time. It's, it had a, a hint, it had a life coach vibe. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, I'm gonna, she's gonna lead me somewhere really well. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Doing great. We're uh, we're in Koreatown. Yes, I know it's your favorite area. Isn't oh, it? <laughs> uh, we're, I've always said to myself, I want to go to a place where Mexico and Korea meet. <laughs> I really do. Where they fuse the busyness and the food. And yeah. the dirtiness. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's just kind of like... Anyone out there listening, if you if you want to visit Los Angeles, go to Koreatown. If you want to pick up a mattress, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Or on the streets. Part of a toilet. <laughs> Part of it. Some of them have like uh, some of them have like messages. Well, and we we were talking outside about you're like, what are these businesses around here? Everybody comments on that when they come here and have to stand outside for any amount of time. Because yeah, yeah, for sure. It's like ba- like next door is baby clothes and like golf clubs. Yeah, there's places here that have weird, uh, you know, uh, weird mashups. Like, you know, I want to buy a wig and do my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I want to buy an apricot, and I also kind of want to get my nails done. I want to always do my taxes in disguise i mean i don't know about everybody else but that's kind of <laughs> <laughs> how long have you lived in la now Ooh, tough question six years gonna be on it's gonna be seven coming in january th- yeah it's gonna be seven soon Dang, seven I'm, i just hit eight what, it's like painful what happened i know what Remember when you showed up <laughs> and you're like i'm gonna take this town yep we're still doing it and now every day it's almost like um I have to kind of like pretend there's a Disney theme song in my head every day where I like wake up a little bit triumphant because <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> because by the end of the day, it's just more like well, white noise. <laughs> well, when you get older, you start actually singing the song and then they think you're crazy. Yeah. 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 Uh, when you showed up to Los Angeles, were you, sing- were you single? Yes. That This is a weird town to be single in. Yeah. I wasn't really single for weird. very long. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was yeah. single. Though. I, I mean, just... You know, my girlfriend just moved in together. Sorry, ladies and guys. Just just recently now? <laughs> it was just recently out in September. Congratulations. And thank you. Uh, we were I was single out here for forever. And I wh- wonder what that what a shit show. I need to know more about what that was like for a guy because I have a lot of girlfriends who are still single or perpetually single. Perpetually single? And I think for women the dating experience is equally negative, but uh, for totally different reasons. Right. Uh, I was here. I was in L.A. during the height of the dating app season. Oh. Oof. But you know what? What did that mean? You know what that meant? It, it, we were all in the same boat. There was no classes. There was no, like, Raya people and Coffee Meets Bagel people and, you know, weird Craigslist people. We're all on Tinder. We're all doing it. Yep. <laughs> it's just one class. Influencer. You see an odd celebrity there. Just some spaz. Some <laughs> person who's clearly <laughs> in sex work. We're all in here. <laughs> And now it's all comp- compartmentalized and stuff. But uh, I, I was getting, like, really fed up. I was like, this is bad. It yeah. wastes a lot of time. It's a, I feel like you moved here for a certain reason. I didn't move here for a certain reason. Obviously, career I, for career, I assume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you you know, your time is valuable because you're in your car a lot. You're, uh, you're trying to allocate your time towards helping your career. And then you, you, you match with some person. You're like, okay. You sit down across them. This is a complete waste of time. You feel like, oh, I could have been at a show. I could have been doing, doing anything else. Anything else and talking to this moron. Well, and for a guy, <laughs> it ends up being expensive because right. I feel like the guy's always like expected to pay. Right. Not that I, I when I hey. went on dates back in the day, I used to try to pay for half. About 50% of the time, they'd let me pay for half. Right, right. 50% of the time, they'd pick up the tab. Um, That's not bad. I mean, we're talking dinner or drinks? Drinks, usually. Yeah, dinner's, um, like, dinner's like, a, like, whoa, buddy, what are you trying to say? Yeah. Dinner? What, if, are we 50? I'm Off trying, the top? <laughs> I have no idea what dating even feels like anymore, but I think, like, if I was vibing with somebody, then I didn't feel as bad if they paid. If right. I wasn't, then I'd really insist on paying for half so they didn't feel like th- that I right. wanted a second date. I'm old school. I'm like, first date, I pay. Yeah. And you that gets, can't it's talk. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, first date, I think it's a nice gesture. What were some of your, like, worst experiences wow. on Tinder? I've never asked anybody that, but I just oh. you brought it up, so I want to know. Well, uh, one time... <laughs> I uh, went on a match with a woman who was in an open relationship. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyone out there who's uh, Mormon knows what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or in Utah. 
Ooh, a- yeah. Annie Hole. So we uh, match with this woman. She's like, I'm in an open relationship. I go, oh, you know, that sounds kind of complicated and weird. She's like, no, 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 it's totally cool. I'm like, all right, you know. So uh, we go on a date. Now, this woman, very pretty, she uh, she had like that kind of like, uh, you know, earthy vibe. Like hippie? Uh, I don't know. The kind of person that looks like, you know, she's, uh, I don't know. She's a vegan, but she's also kind of, maybe she's in a band, some tats. She's kind of like, you know, I don't wear makeup, and she was very pretty. And I was like, hey, you know, and she just like, just really just like, this is me. And I was like, okay. So we show up on this date, and she had like a jean jacket on, some shorts and some some vans, you know, kind of like a Silver Lake, kind of like East Side vibe. Sure, yeah. So... We show up, we go, we go, uh, we went to a diner. That was my move back in the day. The diner. Yeah, diners are classy. It's like, hey, there's some food. <laughs> yeah, real Affordable, classy. Affordable, hey, not too pretentious. Apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of options. Uh, decaf. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we sat down, whatever, and we uh, had a bite to eat. We chilled out. And it was kind of understood things were going to happen. So we went back to my apartment, and then she took off her, uh, her jean jacket, and we started making out. And then I get a whiff of something. I was like, what's going on here? Is it me? You got to assume it's me. Mm-hmm. I was like, maybe the window's open. Maybe someone just like decided to light a garbage on fire, <laughs> a dumpster on fire. <laughs> I go closer. I was like, do you smell something? And she's like, oh, yeah, I don't wear deodorant. Ugh. Now, listen, I get it, ladies. Ammonia, I, I get it, the aluminum. I get it. Breast cancer. G- give me something, though. Yeah. Rub some salt. Get an air freshener. The no deodorant. Th- <laughs> I, I know a couple people that do that. Tom's. Make an attempt. Yeah. She was just like. Crystals. I don't know. Anything. R- yeah. R- rub a tarot card under there. I don't know what you do. So she was like, uh, I was like, oh, okay. And, you know, I'm a guy. I'm like, whatever. We're going to continue. So we start fooling around some more. And I could not continue. Is pungent? Pungent. Is a word. I, it was. It was. It was so palpable. Like you can cut it in the air. It was so. And I was in a, in a room. I was a roommate at the time. And I was like, ah, I don't think I can continue. I'm like, why? It's like I don't know if it's the deodorant thing. And she snapped on me, and she was like, oh, is that not good enough for you? I'm like, you want me to wear deodorant? Do you know what the fuck is in deodorant? Do you know what's in it? I'm like, hey. Things that make this not happen. Yeah, <laughs> aluminum <laughs> helps this conversation not to happen. <laughs> So we go outside, and we're waiting on my front steps and waiting for an, I get an Uber, you know. Because uh, I'm a nice guy, you know. I called her noobs, you know. Yeah. So the she's waiting outside, and a friend of mine was a neighbor, who was also a comic, was like, hey, Eddie. I go, hey, what's going on? I go, hey, this is, uh, you know, Stacy, whatever her name was. And she was like, hey, what's going on? Uh, oh, what are you guys doing? I oh, was just chilling out. She's just waiting for her to grab an Uber. And she's just quiet the whole time. He said, oh, okay, cool. Well, you know, have a good night. You too. And she was like, ha. Huh. I go, what? She's like, well, he knows we hooked up, but we didn't. I go, who cares? You'll never see him again. It's like, no, I just look like, oh, you just like, you know, had you, you did your, you had your fun, and now you just send me off. I'm like, what's going on? She gets in the cab. I'm like, bye, see you later, enjoy your marriage. So <laughs> <laughs> we go, we go. I go back in my room. I was like, it's still here. Ugh. And then I did laundry. It was still there. I had to sleep in the bedroom. I had to get that whole place fucking professionally cleaned. It's it's pretty bad. I've, I incredible. Have, I've smelled that smell on a few oh, people. Incredible. There's one person that runs in our friend's circle. He's a friend of a friend. Does who, he know? Have you had intervention? No, I don't know how he doesn't know. But he nobody know. will say anything to him because he has money and he's from a famous family. Uh, but every time he takes off his suit coat, it's like, pull. Uh, a suit it coat? It is bad. If he's wearing like a suit, yeah. What's his business? I don't fucking know. <laughs> I'll tell you after this podcast uh, is done. Is he a comic? No. Oh, good. No, no, no. He's a... just a famous family. So that's that's the kind of people I was dealing with. Yeah, that's harsh. Just Stinky perverts. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, that's I, and open too. You're like, no wonder you're in an open uh, relationship. Maybe he's just like telling you, yeah, well, you should get out of the house. You know, I have a close friend who um, was really trying to be in love with this woman. <laughs> it sounds like a weird thing to say. <laughs> what? But like, two years ago, he was dating this girl, and they were they really really enjoyed each other's company, and she was really in love with him, and yeah. and he couldn't he couldn't fall in love with her fully because uh, 
B.O.? He, not B.O. It was pheromone. Like, her pheromones. He did not like how she uh, naturally uh, smelled. Are we talking about vagina? J- I think just everything. She needs yeah. some yogurt. Yeah. <laughs> she needs a dipper pussy in yogurt. Yeah. Sorry, can I say pussy? And, and he <laughs> said, you know, he tried so hard, but he, like, there was It was that bad do. down there? I don't know if it was just down there. He didn't specify, but... Um, That's a tough deal for ladies, because you, 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 gotta, you gotta be a chemist for your body. You gotta, yeah. You like, gotta get some probiotics. I gotta make sure I'm clean down there. But guys, you know, hey, you know, it's not like it's all like, you know, whatever, you know. It's not like a Jeep. It would it take do- a lot for a guy to have, like, balls are already kind of, like, gross. But, yeah. like, guys are pretty tentative. I only know my there, own. I think. I've never gotten close <laughs> enough to know, but <laughs> I'm assume. But, you know, guys that have, like, a lot of uh, the pubes, if you if it's too, you know. Raucous. If it's, <laughs> yeah, if it's a little too thicket, the thicket is too much, you know, you got to shave that down. Because it's meant to hold the, the aromas. I was asking you at the uh, out front how to pronounce your last name right because I couldn't decide if your last name was Italian or Spanish. Right. And I've taken both Italian and Spanish. Really? You speak both? Uh, no, I, I, sp- I was almost fluent in Spanish at one point, but I've lost a lot of it. But and you came I was here. Conversational in Italian. Oh, really? At conversational? One point. Yeah. But I've lost both of them. You could be, you could look, you could look like Italian. In part. Your part. A little bit. I can see you like walking around Rome with like a nice handbag. Yeah, r- like, right. Telling a pigeon to get the hell out of my I way. I just bought <laughs> a nice handbag in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Go figure. Yeah, well. um, but isn't Seppi Bush? <laughs> hedge, man. Is it Hedge? Okay. You know, I was close. Did you figure it out? I was close. Do you want to know the story behind it? No. It's, it's yeah, a, I mean, it, I do want to know. Yes. It's intriguing. Did you say no? Yeah, no, I, I said that on accident. <laughs> no. You said, did you figure it out? And I was answering that. And then So my <laughs> grandfather, back in good old southern Italy, he was, a, he was an orphan. He was left at a church as a baby in the early 1900s. And he stayed at the orphanage till he was, back then, it was, it was combined with a church back then. So, like, in a church would take in, you know, kids, whatever. Nuns would take care of the kids. So he stayed there until he was, like, maybe, oh, I don't know. I think he was, like, 14, 15, never got picked up. Uh, story of my career. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never got chosen. Uh, so uh, I was, he stayed there for a while. And then some family took him in because back then in rural, rural Europe, families would take in a kid like almost as a worker, you know, just like, hey, you don't have to work on the farm and we'll feed you and we'll take care of you. We'll be like a foster parent or something like that. So he stayed with them for a year. And then he said, screw it. And he joined the military. Because back then, you had no family, no affiliations with anything. He had no belonging. He wanted to be a part of something. So he said, you know, I'm just going to be going to the military. So he joined the Italian military at the time. He didn't have a last name. So the government contacted the church and asked them, where did you find him? What's his history? What's whatever? And they said, oh. well, he was left on a hedge as a baby. They so s- he's of the hedge. Della means from and, he- and from the hedge. And he- means hedge. So from the hedge. So Dang. he was left there as a kid, They fa- as a baby. They found him. They brought him in. Crazy. And that's how he got his last name. That's how I got my last name. So if you see anyone with the name Della Seppi or Della Sieppe, as they pronounce it in Italian, uh, they came from that kid. That kid's discarded, <laughs> left on the side of the road. That's pretty, it's like, like a stray, almost. Yeah, like a stray. Well, <laughs> well that's, I mean, because I used to have, I used, I had a family Weird, um, huh? that took in strays all the time, and I named them exactly where we found them. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, t- Tamara Bus Stop. I, ha- I had a cat <laughs> named Pine Log. Pine Log, Subway p- Pine Log. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, right? That is crazy. So are you first generation? Yeah, my dad came to North America when he was like 30. And what area at 50. did you grow up in? And my mom is from Peru. My mom's from South America. Okay. She, she, uh, she moved uh, Toronto. I'm from Toronto. I'm Canadian. Did you know yeah, that? Yeah, no, I knew you were Canadian because yeah. that's how you and Julia and the whole gang are so tight. We're tight because we're all scared together. <laughs> <laughs> we're all terrified. You know, but Canadians <laughs> do have some ups on us as far as just like, you know, when you're good in Canada, you can make mon- you can make money. Yeah. And, I, and it sounds like a strange... You are Italian. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's like, there, there's something to be said about the way that comedy operates in Canada. Well, there's no star system there, which means there's no, because America's, because Canada's like, hey, all the real stars are down there. Like, you know, from, from like Conan O'Brien to like Jimmy Fallon or whatever. Yeah. But there's still, there's still a middle class of entertainment that needs to be filled. And that's where Canadians come through. So you can make... You know, low end thirty, high end a hundred thousand dollars a year just being a comedian. Being just a being a comedian, and we all have TV credits. You know, you do TV sets well, and on. just on residuals too, because of the serious channels yeah, and all that. You could do a little bit of that too. That's, uh, I mean, that's just it, bonus. Th- there's a bonus. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ways you can make a, make a living 
down there, and I did for the longest time, and I still go back. Why and does still anybody do shows. leave? <laughs> I know, right? It's for cold, real. man. I know. And the whole, all the hope is here. Yeah, uh, the hope and the failures. Yeah, but <laughs> but you know, the funny thing is, Canada always has. We always have this chip on our shoulder, like you know, no matter. I, I was on national television there doing a show, kind of like Best Week Ever kind of thing, or like Guy Code. Yeah, was, yeah. But we made fun music videos. Yep. Uh, you know, Deborah Di Giovanni. Yes. She was on the show She's too. Fantastic. So I was on TV every day there, on a show, uh, being one of being one of a of an ensemble segment sort of thing, on uh, ensemble on this TV show, and I would still get pe- people be like, "You should move," like, "Why? I'm doing it." Yeah. Like, no, you should move down there. Like, so there's always a thing like, "Yeah, you're doing it here, but you're not." But you're really not really doing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wonder what that is. Do you know anything is. about sports? Yes. Okay, so it's almost like if you was a, if I was a Japanese baseball player and an all star, they're like, "You're great. You should go to you should go to America." But why? I'm doing well here. Yeah. Well, and, the, and you have to look at the cost of living and stuff, too. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I have a lot of friends that have left Chicago and then moved back to Chicago. Right. Because the scene there is, is that exploding. Where you're from? That's where I started comedy. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And so, um, and there's, you can, the people can just sustain a much better living. The cost of living is a little bit better. I mean, you're, um, you're working. You're, like, on the road. You're, yeah, like, in the yeah. conven- You're, like, in a, doing a, what gig is this? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. You know, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a great place to be from. You know, it's funny, Canadians, we all do this. We're all like, oh, it's a great place to grow up. It's beautiful. It's clean. The comedy's good there. The shows are good there. Life's great there. And they're like, oh, would you ever move back? Ah, that'd be my nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel about Wisconsin. It's I mean, like I, sitting in your mom's house. It's I like, grew up there, which is like basically hey, like Canada. So cold. <laughs> so close. Are you like a, a Packers fan? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's I mean, you know, I am. I'm... As far as being involved in football, though, I fell away from it in the last, like, five years. I right, don't really right. care. As, like, I'm so busy with shit, just trying to, like, survive. Right. What's the deal with America? You guys I always, <laughs> always kind of like, oh, you're Canadian? And you give me, like, a little Canada. I don't have a Canadian accent. I don't think I do. You don't, no. But when you do, they really call it out. And they're like, you guys talk weird. I go, really? America talks weird. <laughs> Wisconsin's crazy. Wis- Oh, oh yeah, don't, don't you know? Yeah, my Minnesota. aunts all talk so funny. They're just like, yeah. oh my god. There's, you got Texas, <laughs> you got Florida. You guys all sound fucked up. Yeah. Why do we sound weird? Well, and <laughs> it was. I think it was the balance of. Well, I started um, doing public speaking in Wisconsin, so yeah. we actually had to practice getting rid of it, losing the accent. Is that something you actually ha- were conscious of as a young lady? <laughs> Um, a little bit. Like, when I was a kid, when I was learning to speak, I lived in North Carolina. All right. So when I moved up from North Carolina and was around Wisconsin people, like, part of that canceled each other. What were your parents doing? Why are you moving around like uh, that? They were originally Army. Wow, Army Brad. Mm-hmm. De- both? Yep. Both of them met in the Army. No wonder you're in shape. <laughs> right? <laughs> no wonder I'm disciplined. You're disciplined. You go to the gym <laughs> a lot. You're in shape. Yep. Yep. Ah, yep. You work hard. Came from somewhere. Yeah. Yep. Was instilled in me. But then they, they both left when I was like seven. Okay. They were out of it completely by the time I was 10. My dad oh, was out of it completely. But that never leaves them. Yeah. They're, they're military people. Yeah. They're oh, like, yeah. hey, you know, get up at this time and get some shit done. Yep. Interesting. They just do shit. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. For my, my career, being an, immig- have, being an immigrant from immigrant parents... Uh, you always feel like you got to work extra hard because you feel like you you, you got to assimilate. You don't belong. You gotta you gotta hustle. So it's kind of ingrained in you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So what was your upbringing like in Canada with first generation parents yeah. from other? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, w- and how did they meet? Uh, well, the way they met would be today standards considered illegal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. Uh, uh, so my my dad was married, uh, and then uh, he married a woman, uh, I think, in Canada. First, my dad moved to Brooklyn, New York. Mm-hmm. Now imagine going to Brooklyn in the late '60s. You know, it's not like you know. Uh, it was rough then. Yeah, it wasn't like you know, uh, you know, a crystal shop and organic juices and hemp uh, hemp skipping ropes. You know, it was like fucking dangerous yeah my dad showed up he's like america and like holy fuck it's a war zone yeah you know brooklyn was even like that the first time i ever went which was like yeah 14 you know, years a ago war zone you know <laughs> it was pretty creepy and uh so he said fuck this and he went up to canada because he had relatives up there so he married a woman they uh they got divorced and then he's just this typical european kind of guy he's like i got a house i don't know how to clean it so he went in the n- newspaper and found a cleaning service and a woman came to clean the house. My mom, she worked for a cleaning service when she moved to Canada. Wow. And he asked her out. She said no. 
And then he hired her again a month later. She asked her out. She said, no. My mom told me she came over one time. The house is already clean. There's nothing to do. He just did that to say hi to her and ask her out. And then she said, no. The fourth time, she's like, finally. And then they went on a date. And then they start dating. And then they just like, yeah, let's get married. And that's it. Crazy. And today, that's like stalking. Yeah. That, today, today, that that's like full on <laughs> harassment. That's harassment. <laughs> yeah. Imagine like a guy, you were single, and he just kept showing up at your work. Four times or just like paying you to come into his home. Like, like there's something very bro. <laughs> creepy about that. <laughs> Isn't it weird? Persistent. Yeah, persistent. I get that too. So I'm like, you know. You know, I mean, at least he didn't like obviously I feel like I feel like that's less creepy than being like come on. <laughs> he just shows up. She she's like he's naked when right, she shows right. up or something. Oh, can you do the laundry? Like, this could have been, been a lot This could have been a lot creepier yeah, than yeah, just yeah. the persistency. Yeah, yeah. Is that the word is that a word persistency? Uh, persistence. Persist- uh, well, persistence. I think back then it was like yeah, I think it was like when was this 1979, 1980 and they were both like older so you had there was never like an ill intent behind being persistent. So I was like, you know, I'm going to get her. Yeah. She's going to come around. It's never like, you know, Oh man, and then I'll fucking do this to her, you know. Right, that's what all the songs in the fifties were about. It was like yeah. a chase of some kind. Yeah, like, yeah. Walk behind a girl for like ten miles, and like she'll turn around and she'll look my eyes and fall in love. Like, right. Uh, okay, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and they've been together ever since. Yeah, my dad passed away about five years oh, ago. Oh gosh, I'm smoker, sorry. smoker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my mom's still up there. My brothers are still up there. So how many brothers do you have? Two. Two. Are you uh, middle? Oldest. Your oldest, ah. Yeah, why? Well, I can tell. No, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I know a lot of... Are you an only child? I'm an only. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. You can tell? <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, I just threw that out there. <laughs> I know, no matter what anybody says, everybody's like, ah, oh, I can see it. I really? See it. I feel like that's what everybody always says. I wonder why. I don't know. but I, I can tell. I, can, I don't get this from you, but some only children, I can tell. Yeah. Like, yeah, the world revolves around you, huh? Yeah. All right, well, I'll do it your way. For me, it was like... The, the saving grace for my upbringing was my grandma. My grandma and I are really, really tight. No, we, right? We talk like. Would you consider her a, a role model? Yes, she yeah. actually did my podcast. Two epi- She toured with me in Chicago and did two episodes. She gave I me her would whole life story. love to do your radio show, Natasha. She was. She <laughs> loved it. She was so excited. Did my radio show? I'd love to do your little computer radio show. <laughs> <laughs> computer it's like radio. Pretty much what she calls it too. She's like, I need, I need when I told her I was coming to record today, she's like, I thought you did that on Tuesdays. I'm like, no, Grandma, that's when it comes out on Tuesdays. Uh, yeah. She doesn't understand. They doesn't know it's live. Do ahead of time. Yeah, right. exactly. Right, she thinks right. I'm on the radio on Tuesdays. Yeah. <laughs> if she, so she came in this in this, in this this room? No, she was in Chicago. I have a place that I record at when I'm in Chicago. Ah. Another studio. So she she is in Wisconsin, so she toured with me in Chicago. Toured with you? Mm-hmm. What do you mean? She came on the road for like five. She comes on the road for like chunks of time. Your grandma? With me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Crazy. I know. What's it like hanging out with the grandma on the I, road? I, it's complicated. You must like it. No, I love it. I mean, she's great. She's also, you know, older. And so there's a lot of things, the nuances that you have to d- deal with. Like what? That are different. When you travel with an older person, they're just set in their ways. They have to do things a certain way. Certain right. Certain type of items have to I be. I need warm milk before bed, Natasha. She does. She's got to bring a <laughs> candle and put it in. She's got to, like, cozify the room. Like, everything's got it. She needs a fan. I'm sure she's a lovely lady, and I'm sure you guys get along, uh, like, uh, you know, very, very lovely. But uh, why? Why? Why are you doing this why to she, yourself? Because she she wants to do it, and I and yeah, she's yeah. my favorite. We we just she's my favorite. Does she like the shows? Yeah. Okay. That's she good. she doesn't get sick she's of it. A, she she's always in bed by ten. She loves when I make fun of her. She loves all that shit. And you um, got a buddy. You hang out. You go get breakfast. Yeah, and it keeps me good too. It keeps me from going out too late. When Does she go to the around. gym with you on the road? No. No. The no Aquafit. No. <laughs> We go to <laughs> we go to do like what do they call those pool classes? Aquafit. <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got some water wings and just starts aquafitting <laughs> or whatever they do. But she, when I was a kid, she um, she was very much a quality of time person. What do you mean? Like she would spend a lot of time with me because oh, my wow. parents were so young and in right. the army when they had me. Mom's side, dad's side. Mom's side. Okay. So um, so I like my love language by far is quality of Does time. Does she listen to every show? No, she doesn't uh, really know how yet. She's right. still learning how to find. <laughs> my mom, st- uh, st- uh, the only way I can communicate with my mother is with a landline, and she only has one. No call waiting. No way. Crazy. Wow. 68. No, I, never I didn't even know that they offered phone. that anymore in housing. <laughs> like, just <laughs> you know, one right? line, They're no like, are you waiting. sure? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. It's a dollar a month. If my mom had a cell phone, she would do the classic mom. Not, well, moms now are more hipper, but like she would do the old mom thing where she'd probably, if she had a cell phone, she would just turn it off, turn it on when she needs it. Yeah. And put all her numbers in a little book. My grandma kind of does that too. A little book. Mm-hmm. Does your mom, do your parents text you? Yeah. Yeah, my oh, parent, my so dad, weird. my dad just started texting. My dad just got on Facebook. It's all, it's a whole fucking mess. Emojis. This Christmas is going to be messy. Emojis. I'm to, yep, I'm gonna uh, have to teach mostly the ones the cartoon bitmojis. Uh, they both love to send bitmojis, uh, and it's uh, Christmas is going to be just hell because they're going to all be asking me how to do everything. It's going to be one big tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> wow, Americans say tutorial. 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 Huh. Maybe it's like a regional American thing. It might be. Do you go to home for Thanksgiving? No. You stay here? Yeah. Do they come here? Nope. Nice. I, I need like one holiday where I just don't do anything right. but drink. What about the, the, the <laughs> man friend? Do you go to his family? Uh, No. We haven't seen each other's family. He hasn't seen my... I haven't seen his family in a couple years. What? Yeah. I don't want to get into that's it. That's a crazy thing. I don't want to get into yep, it. Yep. It's messy. I met him. He's very handsome. He is very handsome. A lot of vaping. He does uh, <laughs> do... Thank you. I was like, bro. Thank you. Hey, it's... tell the chimney to chill. Yep. I have written <laughs> get a few jokes about that. Tell him to stop. It's to poison. It's killing everybody, you know? But whatever. You What's can't... he going to do? He's a good looking guy. Don't waste it. I know. Yeah. It's too He's bad. He's in shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he won't stop the vape. I don't know what it is about that shit, but people love cream puff <laughs> flavors. You know what we're gonna read history. Those who don't, you know, uh, read history are doomed to repeat that whole thing. That that uh, that old phrase. Uh, what's happening right now with vaping is like what's happening. What happened in America in the fifties with smoking. Yeah, it's like ah, it's fine. And then like ten years later, and everybody's all, dead, and we're all dying. We're like, huh? <laughs> Seriously, it is. But yeah. Back then, the doctor would be like, "You're nervous. You should have a cigarette." Right. A doctor would be like, ah, you know, you just don't worry. You're just anxious. Have a cigarette. Now it's like, oh, I want a cigarette. Ah, just vape. Don't worry. It's fine. It's just, it's just flavors. <laughs> now, with your dad, did he pass from lung cancer? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It w- yeah. Yeah, smoked a long time. He lived till he was 78, uh, 73, sorry. Which, yeah, I mean, that's it's pretty still, good. My, my grandfather, it's, it's really weird, though, how some people, bodies just recover. Mm. Like my grandfather has smoked. He's a jazz musician. He really, smoked his entire life very heavy. Your uncle was a jazz musician. My grandpa. My grandpa. Mm-hmm. And your dad was in the military. Mm-hmm. Weird. Yeah, interesting stuff. How did that happen? Why didn't he get into jazz? My dad. Yeah. Or why my, my wait grandpa, my grandpa on, the... on my mom's. Side. Oh, why did your mm-hmm. mom get into jazz? She the music. She wanted to get into music, but but her dad was like, no. You can't be me. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that, isn't that a, interesting? What a stern jazz but man. But he quit smoking like, fuck. I think one, it was over 10 years ago. And ah. the doctors just did a scan on his lungs. And they're like, yeah, I don't know what happened. But you're like, yeah. it's just like hit or miss what some bodies can and cannot rejuvenate. I'm convinced my dad uh, stayed alive as long as he did because of uh, red wine and a glass every day. Oh, yeah. A lot of antioxidants. I believe that. Yeah. I actually believe that. That's why deal. Italians are like the oldest living well, out of maybe it's Chinese and then Italians. Chinese <laughs> just don't look old. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but there's a part in southern Italy. I think it's Italy where the, the it's the oldest, healthiest people in the world. Yeah, and no, it's I like know. It's a little village where like they all eat cheese and meat and I've I think, heard drink about wine, this. and they're like all healthy, and it's because of lack of stress and. They just chill out. Have you spent a lot of time in Italy and Peru? Never been to Italy. I want to go. Really? Did you like it? I did. It's my second time being in 20 years. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously my experiences were very different. I'm afraid to go with my girlfriend because she's going to see versions of me that are hotter and taller. And they're like, there it is. <laughs> no! And with the accent, too. There's know, nothing right? hotter than an Italian accent. Ah, my fuck. God. Do you uh, speak it? No, I should. You should learn. But I'm going to learn Italiano. I should. <laughs> it's just got such a good rhythm to it man sexy uh, Ita- italian guys that's like a but italian guys not american italian you who's guys. Big t- <laughs> <laughs> you get some kind named vinnie from boston you're like Ugh. so growing <laughs> up did they give any of their like um what kind of heritage or what, what did they pass down to me instilled in you yeah no. i uh i was very rebellious against my 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 dad was such a disciplinarian that i was like he was so hard on me because you know he's grew up from a, an abandoned farm kid. Italian men were like that too. That was European. Like my grandma's Europeans dad was are like tough. That. Mm-hmm. The Europeans that come over to North America are tough because it's just like they had to get on a boat or plane and no figure nonsense. it out. Mm-hmm. I would be tough too if like someone plopped me right down in China with no cell f- with no phone and just figure it out. I'm like, yeah, I'd be fucking tough too. I'd be yeah. like, I'd get to a lot of nights crying, you know. Um, so uh, as a result, I. Uh, 
I rebelled against my Italian side and I didn't, I had, a, I just didn't want to learn the language at all. In fact, wow. I, I took Italian in school and I thought, well, this would be an easy grade. And I failed. It's hard. It's not even hard. I should know. I have a reference <laughs> at home. I have a last name that symbolizes right? that I should know. Yeah. And my teacher, Miss Piro, sat me down and she was like, Eddie, I have to fail you. I'm looking for grades here. I really want to pass you, but I can't I can't give it to you. I'm like, oh, you know, it's, I'm totally blasé. I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever. What are you going to do? She's like, I don't understand. Your father's a, a Italian. You don't talk to your father about this stuff? And I kind of pause for a while. And she's like, Eddie? And I go, oh, yeah, we don't really talk, talk. And she's like, oh, hmm. maybe I shouldn't have brought that, brought that up. <laughs> so, so why are you here? So did you not have much of a tight relationship with your father? My mother? dad was my dad was like a, you know kind of guys like uh, I'm a good guy. You you got a roof and you don't got to worry about money. Right. He's got a very very like, like I'm providing for you. Yeah, so black and white kind of thing. We and, don't have a relationship beyond that. And at the time, you know, you watch all these sitcoms. Like, why can't you be more like Danny Tanner? Yeah. Why, why can't you be more like? Where's the sincere happy ending after 30 minutes? Be like Mr. <laughs> Belvedere. Hold me and tell me everything's gonna be fine. You know? <laughs> but. Uh, he was a tough love guy, and uh, I think it made me a better comic because of that. Because now I'm like, you know, I'm a, I work hard. I'm trying to have a thicker skin because of it. And at the time, I was young. I was like, this guy's from another world, another another generation. He's like a grandpa, you know. Uh, but, you know, now I look back and be like, you know, he did the best he could with what he had, the tools he had emotionally. Right. And uh, you know, he wasn't equipped to like sit me down like, hey. What's going on with you, son? Are you are you doing well? Are you are you are you dream? You working towards your dreams? He's all he said was things don't do. He'd be like, don't get arrested and don't fuck up and, just, and right. don't waste all your money. And what about your mom? What was your relationship with her? Uh, good. Yeah, like me and my mom are, are tight now, but at the time too, she was she was a, a harsh disciplinarian too. But it's hard, you know. My parents were disciplinarians, but they also didn't care. It's very odd. I've heard that a lot, and that's what I notice from a lot of people that are first generation, it's, I feel like. It's like they never said to me, be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a, be in business. Not they, telling you what to do, but also making a, raining down on the things you do do uh, a little bit. I, I just think they just reiterate the fuck-ups. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean like small stuff like... You know, hey, clean your room, or hey, shovel the snow, or hey, you know, don't stay out too late. And then I, I they never said don't be this or be that. Or when I started doing comedy, they weren't like, you're wasting your time. Never. They never discouraged me. I'm like, hmm. yeah, I'm going to go do comedy. All right. And then I started making money from it, and they and they're like, oh, cool. All so right. th they're just kind of chill yeah, about it all. Very odd. It's a very it's a dichotomy between being stern and being very loose about it. It was. Uh, yeah, that is kind of a yeah. strange thing to settle. So, did you feel like be being the oldest of three boys and with parents like this that you kind of just did your own thing and took care of yourself? Um. Well, I I feel like they 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 did the bare minimum of what they felt like was required for a kid to grow and to be an adult. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to make sure you go to school. If you need to borrow the car, borrow the car. If you need me to pick you up, I'll pick you up. Uh, if you're ever in trouble with money, I'll help you out. After that, you're on your own, hmm. which I kind of liked. It made me mature a little bit, but also but when you're 10, you're like, uh, <laughs> you're like this is a lot of information. I don't know how to deal with it yet. Well, here's something really sad. <laughs> My dad was older, right? The older European guy, so he didn't wasn't as active. He had like a he had separated a couple of vertebrae in his lower back, so he was, was an active guy. Uh, he just he was like he was a part of that generation where like I'm gonna watch TV, all right, you know, and just sat there and watched the news, yep. and we're just like, uh. and I'm convinced the reason I talk like this, you know, I have a deep voice, I, and the sound guy knows I got a bit of a timber. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's playing Angry Birds or something. Uh, it's a uh, pretty voice. Thank you. I th I'm convinced the reason why I talk like this, my brothers don't have a deep voice, and my parents don't either. I'm convinced the reason why I talk because in my formative years, immigrant parents love the news. They love you the have news. a sportscaster vibe. I watch the news endlessly, and that's where I learned English from newscasters. Mm. What? That's that's why because they never spoke English to me. They spoke Spanish and Italian. It's like you trained your own so vocal cords. I, so I had no like English influence. That's why I don't have a Canadian accent. Is because I didn't have a Canadian dad holding a molson and be like, "Hey, I'll go cut the grass." Hey, eh? like I didn't speak like him. 
Right. I didn't speak like my dad because I don't want to huh. speak like my, my dad. Yeah. I didn't speak like my mom because I didn't want to speak like them because I was rebellious towards them. So who do I you look at? Like <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Tom Brokaw. And do you do a lot of voiceover? <laughs> Hardly none. Really? Yeah, I'm not That's a voiceover surprising. guy. That's surprising. You should. I'm, I, I don't like uh, scripted stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like lines. I'm not an actor either. I hate actors. Oh, great. <laughs> you're you're like a, a <laughs> no, but you're a dream come true as far Why? as a comedian. Oh, thanks. I feel like you know. I think I'm a pretty good comic and I'm a good podcaster. I like some uh, of the smartest writers I know are ones that do. Um, do you know Prescott Tolk? No. Um, he's a Chicago guy. Um, I don't know where he lives anymore. I haven't seen him in a long time. Why would I know him? Um, he's a comic. He's a comic. <laughs> oh, okay. He's a stand-up. I don't he's know a, where he is. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> he's a very. Do you know him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know you know. I don't think you know him. <laughs> he's a very talented stand-up. One oh, of the okay, best cool. writers. Prescott, I'm sure you're great. Um, done late night and stuff, and he he wrote on a ton of TV oh, great. shows. Um, and he also felt that way. There would be a lot of agents and managers that would come and be like, you want to do it? And he's like, I don't want to fucking audition for anything. No. I, I thought I, it was cool. My, my agent was like, you know, hey, I got an audition for you. I'm just like, Ugh. <laughs> It's like someone asked me to paint their house. <laughs> Fuck, how do I get out of this? Yeah. I don't want to do it. And I, I, I'm, so, you know. It saves a lot of heartache, to be honest. If you, uh, I, I think the one thing, I mean, just a, a little like, uh, We'll get back to like growing up and stuff like that. I want to know about you too. Yeah. Uh, um, it's uh, something about focus. I feel like is un- is underappreciated in Los Angeles in show business. Yeah, I it's agree. It's like people are like, do it everything, see what hits. Uh, okay, that means I can do everything half-assed and none of it will hit. Or I can focus on what I'm good at. And sometimes the industry calibrates you. It says, "Hey, I, I, I want to be an actor. I don't know. You're not landing anything, but you getting some like love from the podcast world. Go there." Yeah, I think sometimes it tells, and sometimes it tells you not to do it at all, and people are just open micers forever, and they're just like, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll figure it out. It's already been figured out. Um, so you know, I think it's good to focus on something. I think so too. I mean, I this a couple things that you th- feel like you can zone in on. This town is really interesting because it'll tell you, it'll tell you that, like you, you some people tell you to focus, um, and some people will tell you that you need to be good. You need to be good at every. You need to have a lot of cards to show when. Yeah. You know, and you know, as far as this the world of entertainment, I've looked at it. For Who's myself, that talented? Like, Who is that talented? Who's like, like you got to do improv, you got to do sketch, you got to do stand up, you got to do not a podcast. You're going to do all of it well. Who's no one's that talented? Yeah, unless you're famous, then we just assume you're, and then we just in love with your personality. Like a Conan O'Brien could do everything, and we like we love it. Right. Yeah. Well, somebody has to already like you and give you permission to do the other things. Right. Before you know. It's always pleasant when you find out some actor can sing really well. Back but. to role models. Yes, back to role models. Uh, <laughs> my immigrant parents, I feel, are a huge role model in my career. In that, uh, immig- no one works harder than an immigrant. And we know that in Los Angeles. My dad would take a lunch pail to like construction sites and be like, do you need a guy tonight, today? And they, he'd be, they'd be like, no, come back tomorrow. And that's how he would get work at construction sites. My mom would like clean, do anyone's house, clean whatever. And I, comp- I used to compare that to getting on shows in LA. Like I'll show up at a show, say hi, I'll follow up, do whatever. Why can't I go that extra mile? I could never look my immigrant dad in the face and be like, LA is hard. Yeah. He was like, really? You speak the language, you have a skill, you ho- don't have a day job. You're not you on have, the streets. You have all day, you have a computer, a phone, you have every tool imaginable to try to make it work. And it's not hard. It's just not happening yet. So I think that, like, I always think back to my dad and my parents and, like, how hard it must have been to even exist in a time when, we, when these tools weren't available. Right. So, you know, I look at that and I think, wow, you know, yeah, I may not be getting what I'm getting now, but I'll get there and, you know, I should be grateful for what I have, you know. So. You yeah, know. I mean, and did your dad encourage you a lot once you got going in the career? Or no. Did, no? No. Never been to a show. Really? You don't want to hear something crazy? One time, I was on TV at the time. I had a half-hour special up there. I was like, you know, just for laughs. I did TV appearances. And someone went up to my dad and went, hey, your son, I saw him on TV. He's really funny. And he told my mom and not me. And my mom was like, hey, someone went up to your dad and said you were really funny. I'm like, why didn't he say that to me? Why didn't he come up to me and be like, hey, someone's on the street said you're really funny. So do you feel old like, school? Yeah, tough love. Do you feel like when he passed, it left you with these like lingering 
wishes that he would have been more involved in your career, or did it not really matter? Because well, he never heard me do jokes, but I did squeeze him in the eulogy. No, I'm joking. I <laughs> <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. He's here. Might as well give him a Well, I have a lot of friends who have lost parents, and I feel like that that's kind of one of the biggest things that stick with them is, like, I wish they would have been, right. you know. More present that way? More present in that yeah. space of my life. Uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, I kind of look at it like... If someone s- were to say to me, would you want a dad who's always there or a dad that's not there, but you have two different careers, one's better, one's not, I'm like, give me the better career. Yeah. And I know that sounds a little bit like, don't you want a dad who's always there? But like, I don't know. I kind of like the tough love. I do. Well, and also when your career is doing positive things, you feel um, you feel so fulfilled within yourself. You're not getting fulfillment from other yeah. people. And also, I feel like this for myself I feel so secure in the family that I've created with my peers, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, so, like, yeah. we find our people, and right. it's kind of a little bit more of a satisfying feeling than just being born into... Yeah, his tough love set me up for show business, for sure, because yeah. I wasn't getting the attention from him that I wanted, from my parents that I wanted, that I thought I needed because of sitcom television is like, your dad's supposed to sit you down and give you the, give you a talk about life. I'm like, <laughs> what? If my dad were talking about life, he would scare the fuck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> like, like what you have to do what to survive oh my god i gotta eat food now you know <laughs> it's kind of, start i don't want to know his life his life's crazy it would scare the fuck out of me but uh what it did teach me is tough love a lot of tough love a lot of like be grateful for what you have and always want more you know i'll give you a scenario uh i did a show one time at, at the improv and at the lab and for anyone listening at the improv said, you know what, we have a great stage, but what if we had a second stage that was not good? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's put people there. Anyway, I'm happy to perform there. I, I yeah. would love to go there. I'd love to be there every day. Um, so, but uh, I remember the lab back in the day when it was just a, a detachment. Yeah, it was like it looked like it was You like, couldn't even drink booze in there. Yeah, it looked like we're fucking coke heads <laughs> hanging out. I was like, what's it's happening like, here? It was like a ghetto improv <laughs> space. Yeah. So I remember I, did, I put on a show there one time, me and some friends, uh, just a one-off kind of thing. And this one person, this one comic, who was, uh, you know, kind of asking me to get on the show, whatever, I, I put them on finally. They did not have a good set at all. And I'm sitting in the stairwell. You know that stairwell behind the, the bar in the lab? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I'm sitting there, you know, just going over my notes, whatever. And the person walks by me, stands at the pillar in front of me, and starts crying. And I go, are you okay? And they're like, I'm just, you know, I, I bombed. I bombed so bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, it's fine. It's just a show. And then they ran out of there crying. And all I could think about was, I know this sounds terrible, but like, well, grow up. Yeah. Go cry in your car. Yeah. Go cry in your apartment. Why do I got to see that? Because you want me to pat you on the back? Be like, hey. It's going to hey, be fine. Hey, champ. I mean, sure, you're down now, but. Things will pick up. I think some people like you a lot more than you think. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. That's not life. You know, I've never cried from a set. That's not I've life. I've never even left a bad set. Go and cry at felt home. That bad about it. Go <laughs> cry at home. Who cares? It's fine. To, the crying <laughs> is not the issue. It's like, you're doing that so I can see and you can be comforted. Why do you want me to comfort you? Right. You're Stand so right. Stand on your two feet. Yeah, you're so right. It, it's, it's totally self indulgent. You're not crying because <laughs> my emotions were so were so overwhelming, I, c- I couldn't hold it for another 10 feet. Right. The door's right there. Go cry outside. <laughs> the fuck? What am I? It's a comedy show. What are you doing? Pussies. Just a bunch of pussies. Uh, and it, <laughs> I can't assume people aren't as like emotionally stable as me. And some people are just like overwhelmed by certain moments. And I get it. We're all different. We all have an emotional threshold for what we can deem as overwhelming and not. But... Don't be surprised if you don't have the fucking nails to fucking claw through this business. You have to, like, you think this is bad. Try doing this in front of more people. Try doing this when you're paid. Try doing this in front of your parents or friends or you, you know, a room full of a whole, a whole comedy club every night for a weekend. If you think this is bad, it, it, the stakes are low. You're right. Eight, you're eight minutes on in the show with 15 people in the audience. You're, for, you're forgotten the moment you say bye. Right. 
No, and that's the thing is like, <laughs> it's like you what's have to happening because I've had some rough. I mean, I I don't I've I've only had a couple a handful of sets where I was like those were so rough that they still like I'll still have nightmares about them. Yeah, yeah. But you know, doesn't mean I haven't had plenty of bad sets. But you know what? It's a difference between like a bomb and yeah. just like a not great show. So that's what I gained from my, my as a as a, a showbiz role model for my family from from my parents. Yeah. I remember one time I came home as a kid and a, a girl. Uh, broke up with me. I started crying on the couch in front of my dad. And my dad said, uh, you know, sat me, uh, like saw me crying, was just shaking his head, like, why are you crying? He thought, I, maybe I broke my foot. You know, in his mind, why would why would a why would a human being cry this publicly before? Unless oh, they were in pain. He was stabbed. <laughs> right. <laughs> I think he was shot, or maybe he saw his brother die. <laughs> That's what's happened. Surely it wasn't some girl who said no to him at a school dance. <laughs> He walked up to me and I was like crying on the couch and he was just like, never make, never let anyone make you cry like that. Huh. I was like, you got it. And this, I mean, I still do. I mean, I'm a human being, but I'll do it in privacy of my own home or right. in front of my girlfriend if I'm like someone you're really close with. But like, you know, he's just a tough love guy. And I think that's great for showbiz. I think so too. It doesn't mean you have to be insensitive. Then it'd be like, you have to be up there and be like insensitive or you have to be like, tell people, go fuck yourself, whatever. I just think, as a self-sustaining unit, as someone who, you know, is in this business, much like yourself, if I let everything get to me, then it's, then you're not. You don't have it. You don't yeah. have it. You don't have it. No. You gotta forget. You gotta early. You gotta have a. You gotta have a like a, a short memory for good and bad. Yeah. You know, I always think that too. Like my dad, also instilled in me the idea of having a short memory for for the good stuff. It's like, like. If if you're gonna keep thinking about that great set, or you think about that great thing you landed two two years ago, you're gonna hold on to that memory forever, right? And then you're you're not gonna evolve, you're not gonna get better, because you're just sustaining this sort of idea of what you thought you were, what you thought you what, what you think you are because of one moment. That's what I tried to describe somebody recently. I was like, they were like, where would you see yourself in five years? And I fucking hate that question so much. I don't know. I don't know what the business is gonna be like. For all, I, for if someone told me you're gonna be big on this. I'm like, I'm like, I'm gonna be big on the. What does that mean? People, what is a lot that, of people, on the phone? A lot of people have my number. <laughs> what does that mean? Right. You don't know. I you don't know, know where anything. Go. I always try to describe myself as like a little Natasha universe, and right. like I started as like the sun, and wherever I go from here, it could be anywhere along this like you giant are an only platform. Child. <laughs> you are an only child. You're the You're universe. Like, I'm the Everyone universe. <laughs> revolves around you. But like, <laughs> it gives me a whole like giant right. surface area to land. Like, as long as I land somewhere further than where I started, I'm fine. But it could go any of these directions. I'm a big believer in like you know, you know. Put in the work, have fun, you know, don't dilly dally, do it. You know, like I did, I did a show at the comedy store with you. Yeah. You know, so I look at all those people in that room and I, you know, you ever see a comic go up there and just dick around? Like, what are you doing? I know. What are yeah. you doing? I, th there was a couple of those. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> and what you're are you just like, fucking around? Just like, fucking the room up. That's what it is. <laughs> not even that. Just like, even if you're killing it, like, what are you gaining from this? Uh. You're gaining mental security that you. <laughs> I'm funny. Yeah. Well, you're funny to people that have never tried to be funny in their lives. They're amazed that you're, you're you have the guts to speak. Uh, that's uh, fifty percent of it's already they're already in your favor because they're already there for a comedy show. After that, it's it's you doing twenty percent of like dicking around, like oh yeah, that's fun. But put yourself out there, do jokes, put yourself out there, and say yep. punchline and be like, huh? I mean, so that's what my dad instilled, instilled me too. Is like my parents like put in the work. You got to try. Like, don't go up there and just assume you got to put in the work because if you as soon as you start assuming these things it starts as, as soon as you start going up there and thinking like it'll play entitled it'll be fine yeah. i'm funny i'm like are you that they'll let you know yeah, yeah so you know i think that like in a weird way as a young man i thought that these people these two older people from a different world were like didn't get me but man i i totally get it well, and what point did you think you started to realize you might want to be an entertainer? Was there a... 17. Yeah? 17 years old. It was old. later. Yeah. yeah. Early. Well... 17 years old? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's later. That l a lot of people think that they had the first thought of being an, enter an entertainer young, but I don't ever look at it like that. Right. I don't consider church plays and shit. Every right, kid did right. church plays. My first set, I was 17. Your I first stand-up set. Yeah. I wanted to be a comic... So I wanted to be a comic since I was like 15, and the reason why is because... I was good at joking around my friends. I did a couple plays at school. 
but I, 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 having one funny line wasn't enough. I was like, yeah, I can, I, I can do it on my own. Um, and I used to love Jim Carrey on In Living Color. Remember that show? Yeah. Yeah. And if you watch it today, you'd be like, this show is not woke at all. <laughs> <laughs> Handyman? Remember that sketch? Yes. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> um, Just racist uh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> terrible. I get a lot of national television. <laughs> but I used to love Jim Carrey, and I was like, he was so funny. And then I watched his a &E biography, and I love biographies to this day. I love Me too. Uh, origin story biography. And it said that he went to a comedy club in my hometown, and he's from Toronto. I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And then I saw his one-hour special up there. And he was so funny on his own. Just so funny on his own. I'm like, he's funnier than he is on the TV show. I should, I should do that. So then I went to a comedy club. I signed up. So back then. In Toronto? In Toronto. So back then, there was like the sign up. So you call, you leave a voicemail, and then you call the next day, and they read off the whole, all the names that are on the show the next day. Oh, I wish it worked like that when I started. I know, right? <laughs> you just yeah. call. You no name in the bucket. You just called. Yeah. Eddie Delisepe. And then you call the next day. Here are the, here's a lineup for Tuesday, and they say all your names, right? So then I showed up, and uh, it was a, a comedy club, open mic kind of thing. It was booked, though. And it started like 10, and I'm 17. I took the bus there. I'm still in high school. I'm like, what am I doing here? All these older guys are there. Mm -hmm. And when you're 17, everyone's old. You know, 25-year-old starting out is like, you're like a teacher. You know, it was just yeah. weird. So then I finally get on stage, and I go on the microphone, and I say, Hey, and I, it startled. I never heard my voice on a microphone before. It startled me. I was legitimately startled. Was it this resonant already or r resonant? What do you mean? Your voice. Was it like this? Oh, deep? like uh, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So then I started, I started doing jokes. I wrote on a day planner that I had my, 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 uh, from school and nothing's hitting. I'm looking around. People are just kind of like, what's he doing up there? So I started getting nervous. And you know there's a fight and flight thing with human beings. So I, I said, well, I'm going to, I'm not going to get off. I'm going to fight. I'm going to start roasting people in the front row. <laughs> and I roasted this lady. I roasted her, this woman's smile. I roasted this interracial couple. And they started to boo me. Like, boo, get them out. Ugh. And I was like, and I was like kind of pleading with the audience, what? And back then, this comedy club was harsh. And at the time, I thought, that's a little bit harsh. Now I get it. If you were bombing, they had TV suspended on the ceiling, and they would play a video of like an explosion, or like a, someone getting punched out in a movie. Shut <laughs> or up. Like a, or like a, a fire. A what house. club was this? I don't want to say. Does it? Okay, okay. It uh, still exists. I assume. Still exists, okay. and I'll be there December eighteenth <laughs> to the twenty fourth <laughs> in Toronto. Obviously <laughs> redeemed yourself since then. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, to this day, they still give me a lot of work. I play them all the time. I love the I love the club, but at the time, I was like, this is terrible. So, uh, so the comment, so the, the owner came out, uh, so the host shook my hand and I walked down the aisle and all these old guys are like, it's fine. Don't worry. Got on a bus, shocked, took it all the way home. You know, and the only person I told that I was going to go to the show was my mom. I said, Hey, I'm going to this comedy show. I'm going to try to be a comedian. I'm going to try to go up there. I said, Oh, okay, cool. Have fun. Not even like, I'm going to go. Or like, what is it? I'm like, all right. It's like I told him I was going to go play baseball or something. She's yeah. Like, yeah, go See ahead. See you later, kid. So I go up, put my head down on the table when I got home and started crying, as you're supposed to at home. And my mom pat me on the back. And she's like, did they hire you? And <laughs> I think she understood. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a job interview. <laughs> and I'm crying, not for, for joy, you know. <laughs> and I didn't go back for three years. Wow. And then after the third year, I was like, I was getting provoked by my my friends that's uh, usually a telltale sign if you should be a comic. Your friend's like, are you serious? Go. You got to. You got to. I was like a kid. My friends campaigned me to do it. And then uh, I finally, um, yeah, I finally went back and I bombed, but I was okay with it. And I went back. I never stopped since like, since I was 20, It's kind of interesting to hear that because I feel like terrible. commonly uh -huh. from friends. It's a terrible know, experience. It's usually they have an unlikely good experience what? the first time and uh. then the second time they bomb good yeah i mean because that's that's what happened to me too my, right. my first ever mic i did really well and then i did uh, my next show was a 10 minute set what yeah Ugh. in chicago and it, it was awful i right. mean obviously did you get really you got really dressed up didn't you no no yeah. oh did you play I used it down to dress really down that's good I uh, over the last couple of years, I'd say I just became I'm gonna dress how I normally dress. Like I used to when I was young. I even I was always like, you know what? I, uh, 
when you're raised by old people, you have an old you have an old person in you. I don't I don't mean that like <laughs> figuratively. Okay, yes. uh, uh, so I'm not getting raped by old people. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you you have that curmudgeonness in you. Sure. You know, I know you look at me like, oh, he's wearing Yeezys. How can he be like? He's a free flowing guy. I'm, I hate people. <laughs> I'm a, there's a bit of, cr- there's, a, there's a bit of crotchiness, which helps you in comedy because it gives you a bit of an edge, Yeah. but also has you a, a distinct disdain for anybody having fun or anyone putting themselves out there a little bit too much. Sure. So when I was young, even when I was young, I'd see someone up there in like a suit. I'm like, you're going to bomb. Why would you wear a suit? <laughs> you want to look good going down? <laughs> Why would you do that? You look like shit. You're shit. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I see like a. Like a like a comic, a female is like their third time. They're dressing in a cocktail dress and like high heels. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Put on some sneakers. Yeah. If I can shoot the shit. For the first like is seven not- eight years, I dressed seven years. I'd say I dressed pretty down. I saw you like. Why would you do that? And like, if I saw anyone in a suit in an open mic, I'm like, or even like even in, like a spot, I'm like, what are you doing? What yeah. are you hosting a restaurant? Right. Fucking be one of the people. Put on a sweatshirt and fucking chill out. Yep. Cocktail dress and heel. What are you hosting a brothel? Fuck, do it. Tell some jokes. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, I still have this curmudgeonness about me, where I'm not like this sort of like young hip guy who's always like, uh, "Nice man, you be you, man. I like it. I like your vibe. Yeah. Cool, man. Nice fit. You know. <laughs> you don't have to be everybody's friend. Uh, <laughs> From seventeen to twenty, then what did you do? I was I was still a. A crotchy, curmudgeon guy. What were you doing for work? What were you pursuing? Oh, I worked at a Home Depot. Oh. Part-time. That's my last day job. was uh, July 6, 2013. Sorry. July 6, 2006. So when you started pursuing stand-up, you were working in comedy full-time? I started doing day jobs. I worked at Home Depot for five years. And they liked me because I would switch shifts with guys. And they'd be like, hey, I got a show tonight. Can you switch to my late shift? I'm like, all right, get out there, you know. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Go live my dream. You know, whatever. (laughs) <laughs> uh, they're still good guys. I'm sure they're sure, sure they're still around. Um, uh, but then I started getting some work, opening for people, and like you know, getting some work on my own. The odd like gig here and there. So then I quit my job in 2006, uh, July 6, 2006. That was the last day job I had to this day. So, wow. So it took me about. From, You're pretty lucky. I'm in lucky. That I'm lucky. I'm lucky. I mean, well, ah, it's also th- the work and the talent as well. I think I'm lucky. I, I don't like that word. I, I think I am a. Uh, I'm uh, I'm lucky to have opportunities. I'm skilled enough to take advantage of them. That's a really great way to put it. So there you yeah, go. Yeah, because I don't like just the word luck, but we just unfortunately don't have enough terms for yeah, the same kind Yeah, luck's a scratch thing. ticket. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having the skill to take advantage of luck is a different story. Yeah, uh, you know, and the it, timing and yeah, all that like stuff. Yeah, if, like if, if, ju- if, someone, if some big, huge uh, uh, producer sees you at a show, that's luck. If you, get, if you impress them, that's you. Yeah. And so. it, and that's the thing I always talk to, um, you know, younger comedians about. Generally, mostly like insta famous people who think <laughs> they're, <laughs> that they're uh, comics. I mean, because it's just you know you don't want to be seen too soon. Yeah, it's hard. I have a lot of people that'll be like, "Oh, this person's coming in, and uh, I need to get in front of them." I'm like, "Do you though? Um, maybe yeah. you shouldn't rush that." I, I think th- I think there's a beauty and a- ambiguity when it comes to show business. It's like sort of like sort of beautiful that you can just struggle and no one really notices that yeah and i think the problem is with stand-up is like you if you don't think you're gr- you're good in the beginning it, it keeps you alive it keeps you going like i'm good I'm, I'm, in, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well i'm you know i'm a few sets away you know I'm pro- the, the problem is some people manifest that into like i i judd apatow needs to see me yes he needs to see me I'm like buddy you're not a prodigy this is you got a couple laughs from friends in an open mic but i think that you mistake that false sense of confidence as who you are, but it's just a way to keep you keep you going. Yeah, yeah, that's so a problem. How many years did you work in Canada before you decided to move to LA? Like, when? What was your turning point to move to LA? Uh, did you feel like you just hit the ceiling as far as yeah, what you could accomplish? I, I looked at I looked at the the landscape and I was like, I, my only goal is to repeat what I've already done. So it's time to get out. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, you know, I'm not here to boast and say like. Oh, takes a lot of guts, man. But I left behind a lot. You know, I was getting, it sounds like you did. I left. I was getting recognized. I was like making a you know, serious living. Uh, serious. I was making a good living. You know, I live in a beautiful country. It's not like I was in war torn fucking Slovenia or something. It's sure. Like, yeah. It's a beautiful place. You know, people are fighting to get in there. And if someone, if I told everyone I'm sticking put, they're like, I get it. You're Canadian. You're part of this country. I get it. You know, you don't have to. 
it's good to do it's it's fine to do well where you're from um but i just like you know i just wanted more and i just felt like i owed it to myself and i i think regrets a, hu a horrible thing i think i would hate to like sit around click on the tv and be like oh be oh, netflix it'd be netflix no, i mean i just see a netflix some kid that i thought of, who started way before me who went to la or went to new york and tried and made something of it and i'm just like i was afraid to be a nobody that's the problem right it's afraid to be a nobody yeah if you're willing to be a nobody then that's the only way you'll ever be somebody i think that's very well put Thanks. <laughs> but I really think like, you have to be you have to be willing to be nobody for a long time to be somebody for a small for even a nanosecond. You have to like put up with, you know, people being like, who are you? Or people being like, yeah, we'll get back to you. Or like, yeah, you're on the list. Or like, yeah, you know, uh, we'll book you when we have a chance. Or, or oh, just every time you run into old friends, are you still doing that comedy thing? You, you know, know, let I, them I say it all. I don't care. Get asked that shit all the time. And I had to learn to just not get offended by it. I'm yeah. like, oh, people yeah. think it's a comedy thing. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> let them say it until until you do well enough where they're like, can you give me tickets? Where it's undeniable, yeah. Can you, can, you, can, you, uh, can, you, can you do a shout out for my cousin? He's a big fan. You know, it's like. And when you first moved here, what was kind of some of the what were some of the hard hitting facts about moving to LA from the situation you were in? Uh, I mean, everything's happening here, but nothing's happening. Kind of yes, thing. it's hurry up and it's wait. all it's all here. I'm like, great. Are they at the shows? I don't. Know, maybe not. Yep. I'm like, well, then why are they? And you know, it's funny. Like someone has seen you. Someone has seen me. That can change my life like that. Uh, and they're just aware and they're just like, meh, you know, maybe, maybe not, you know, I just, I think, I think you go from like wanting to be a star to wanting to sustain a great living, you know, I would love to. Or just wanting to be uh, successful in your own right and respected. I think, I think I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't want to be one of these guys that's like, I want to be Kevin Hart. I want to be fucking a household name. That, that's a great goal to have, but I think I just want to at the end of the day, look back and be like, I have a body of work that I love. I can, to this day can go to any city and sell out a theater. I have a fans that like, like quote things that I've said, whether it's on a podcast or on a or in stand up. That's what I want. I want to bring yeah. people that really appreciate and like, and me to provide a service for a horde of people or a group of people or, you know, or a scene or whatever. That's uh that makes me happy too. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I look at some pre people's career, like a guy like Tom Segura has a great career, or like you know, um, Amy Schumer has a great career. Obviously, she's got movies too. But like you know, all these people that th that their own person, where it's like I have a podcast, I have my stand up career, I have social media going on, and I I run my own business. I do when I want, Joe how Rogan, I want. Like you know, I look at I look at a lot of people that are I, I respect people that are willing to um, do things on their own clock and not say yes to everything to the point of exhausting yeah. the public. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that exhaust the public. Of course. <laughs> you want to be your own person and you want to be in charge of what you do, not like, I don't want my career being dictated by some guy who's a failed UCB student who's like, this. I, I, I know who should be on late night. Yeah. I know who should be on this channel or this station. Or I can just like, you know, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. And eventually they'll be like, hey, you should come do this. I'm like, I know, dude, I've been submitting to you for 10 years. Right. So I think that, like I said, the business calibrates. It tells you where you should be going. And, if it's, and it's, you know, you, you see there's people who like social media stars or like Instagram stars are like probably can't still to this day probably audition and, and don't land anything. But a million people follow what I, a million people watch what I do every day. Yeah. Who's winning? Right. I'm I, winning. Well, and and that's the thing too is I, you know, I've I've constantly been coaching a lot of friends through this recently because a lot of people do get really down when they don't get something right. or they look at like, oh, they got that. Why didn't I get that? You know, so I got some calls this week about like what somebody are, what, else's news. Like what is is are, are we in high school? Yeah. Is this a different table? Oh, she right? got she's dating him and he's he got a new car. Ooh, what are we doing? Yeah, and it's like just do your own shit. Who cares? There's, there's two. <laughs> uh, I'll give you an example. There's um. This, hypothetically speaking, there's a let's just say there's a comic who makes money but has no TV credits. Does some road work, you know, maybe makes some residual money, the odd gigs here and there, makes a decent living. Let's say 60k, 70k. But then there's another comic who's been on late night, who's got you know uh, industry darling, gets on every show, people are like courting around to see them, but they don't, they're not booking anything. They have three roommates. They live in like some 
who's winning? They have a part-time job. Who's winning? Right. Yeah. It's just everything looks good on paper. Yeah, <laughs> People want like, things to look good on paper and so on social media. I, but yeah, like who's winning? This person's got a million followers. Do they? I, I, I think they do Postmates too. Like, I don't know. Right? No one knows anything. Nobody knows anything about anybody. It's all appearances. So if you want to like grade yourself on what other people are doing, you're fucked because you don't know anything about their situation. Well, and that's that's something that I wrote um, one of the pilots I'm pitching right now. But one of, one of these guys I knew... Um, We've had about 150,000 Twitter followers. It was like a Twitter famous comedian. Yeah, yeah. His comedy kind of reflected that too. Very one linery Twitter sounding. Okay. Um, blue check mark and everything. This guy could not pay his bills ever. Yeah. And you know, and I had a lot of people be like, "I wish I just had a career like that." I'm like, "You don't even, you don't even know that I have don't to. Know anything. I have to loan this guy fifty dollars for gas every week." <laughs> I, I know a guy that was like had two late night spots, and uh, he told me that he had to after the show he had to turn on his Uber app, and I go, "Oh, you you getting a ride?" He's like, "No, I'm driving." I'm like. Fuck. I've been at a day job since I was fucking twenty five. And yeah. you're and you're 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 a taxi driver. Like who's winning? Right. Yeah, it's very S- true. I think I think sometimes what when you move here or any any situation, whether you're in Wall Street or you're working in a you know, a business or a show business, whatever, it slowly de- demystifies. Everything gets demystified and you see what it really is, you know. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, what do you have coming up uh, that you would like to promote? This will be coming out on Tuesday. Oh, well, if I can promote one thing, the one thing I want to promote is that I have a podcast called Exacta Mundo. It's a Ooh. solo podcast. Ooh. Thank you. Uh, it's uh, not part of a network. I don't believe in them. Uh, I'm joking. <laughs> 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 I'm joking. <laughs> joking. It's fun. Exacto it's Exacta Mundo. A, uh, <laughs> so uh, basically what the, the premise of the podcast is we take buried news stories and I dig them up and roast them and talk about them. So stuff that like, you know, stuff gets under the radar. I feel like we have a lot of news that's like the president's getting impeached or natural disasters or school shootings and all those things have a place in the in our ears. But uh, there's some stuff that's like ridiculous and we can joke around about, you know. Yeah. So that's how, you know, I do that. And so how long a, is it? Uh, about 50 minutes. 50? 50? zero. Wow. Have a good time. Solo. Wow. Yeah. How many episodes have you done so uh, far? 30. 30 just came out. Damn. You know, we just, uh, for instance. Uh, Who's we? Uh, you and your producer? And, uh, me and my Zoom recorder. Are you and your Zoom uh, recorder? <laughs> H6. <laughs> Uh, Ooh. thanks, buddy. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, some stories, like, for instance, like, they just, uh, back in my hometown, in a suburb of my hometown, they just opened up a, a sex brothel for real doll with real dolls. You know, those, those $10,000 mannequins, those fuck toy mannequins? Yeah. So, like, there's a whole, they have a fleet of sex dolls, and you can go in there and pay to use them. I don't really know how to feel about that. It's easy. It's gross. <laughs> yeah, it's it's gross, like but it's, it's also but like... But you have to book an appointment. Like, is Christine ready? Like, And then there's some guys like putting a hose in her mouth, just like, yeah, she'll be done in a minute, and it just hose her mouth. But <laughs> it's like, all right, cool. These these women don't feel objectified and hoarded. <laughs> it's yeah. like very weird. They're, 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 they're like toys, a... but they're like, it's just terrible. So Yeah. I, so stuff that's like you may have read in a blurb in BuzzFeed, I take that and I analyze it. That's cool. Yeah, so you know. And your and your real name is Edmundo. Edmundo. So like I'll have So Exacto Mundo. Exacto Mundo. And sometimes I'll have fans or people who listen to the podcast that'll like send me in like some of their local paper, like, hey in Wisconsin, some guy set fire to a cheese factory. I'm, like, I'm gonna what? start sending you shit. I'm like <laughs> yeah, I get people sending me all the time, like, dude, like uh, some guy got killed by a pigeon. What? <laughs> you know, like, you know, a lot of local news outlets have these stories that are kinda like no one talks about or like that are kind of funny, you know. And so is is it available on iTunes? iTunes, Spotify, all the things. Yeah, we uh we uh, in our first week we debuted in the top one fifty in iTunes, and we it's amazing. Yeah, we're doing well. I had an old podcast called Barely Friending, that did really really well, and that's that ended. So I'm kind of reaping the benefits from the residual fans from that. Cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Where can everybody find you on social? At Eddie Della Seppi. I know it's a hard name to spell, but if you type in uh, Eddie Della. And then It'll an S, you'll find me. I'm a, I got a blue check mark. I don't want to talk about it. He's uh, famous. Uh, He's super famous. Famous somewhere where famous people don't really count. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, that's it. And website for tickets or tours? Uh, I'm going to be in uh, Toronto, my hometown. I've got Canadian fans out there, but I'll be there in December for a week. And I'm going to be in New York City at the end of January for a week. So I yeah. will, too. When? Um, I'm going to be starting a, w- a monthly show out in New York again. What time? What, what day of the week? Um. 
I think Thursdays. Oh. So we should talk if you want to come pop on. Yeah. Uh, where's it at? Uh, West Side. Hey, West Side Comedy Club on yeah. West Side. Yes. That was the last place I headlined. Oh, wow. Great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to be there. Uh, I'm going to be, I think it's January 26th to 31st. Which place? A bunch of places? Oh, I'm just going to be hanging around doing shows all around okay, town. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. Yeah, I'll hit you up. Yeah. Let's do yep. it. Yep. I, I used to be in New York like every other month, and then this year I didn't, I've didn't. i only been once, so I feel like a failure. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a failure. I love New York. Right. And my girlfriend, uh, she works for a tech firm, their head office in New York. She has to go there four times a year. Free, oh, fuck. Free hotel. Perfect. Oops. Oops. Whoopsie daisy. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> 401k. Oops. Dude, yeah, good setup. That's a good setup. And you can find me at NPH Comedy. You can follow this podcast at Future Role Model or Role Model Pod on Twitter. Upcoming tour stuff is nphcomedy.com. Do you, have a, do you have a fitness account, too? I don't have a fitness you account. You should. <laughs> You're fit. Get I'm out a there. Fit lady. Get out there. I just do random men's health stuff. Actually, I haven't done that in a while. But If you did a fitness account, that'd be cool. If I did one, I'd be like, buddy, what are you doing? I just throw it into my regular. Now that there's no likes anymore, I can put it back in. I know, right? <laughs> now what do we do? TikTok? And he, and Gross. Right? I know. I keep getting told to do TikTok, uh, and I opened it up one day, and I was like, I hate everybody on here. I'm done. I know. Let's get out Fuck of here. all this stuff anything uh any last closing remarks <laughs> fun podcast and what's this camera called again <laughs> uh, what amiibo. amiibo i'm gonna get amiibo for my podcast get the amiibo great podcast great job thank you it's a lot of fun good having See you ya. bye